We're very, very blessed to have uh, politicians drop into our studio, especially in the lead up to the election. And so we want to welcome in studio this morning, David Seymour, leader of the ACT Party. Good morning and kia ora, David. Hey, uh, kia ora koto. Now, I know politicians are very busy people, even more so when election time rolls around, but everyone, including politicians, need their sleep. So first question off the bat for you, David. How many minutes of sleep do you get every night? <laughs> and, um, and, and, where, and sorry, as a yeah. follow-up, Where's the best place in the beehive to take a nap? <laughs> so probably about 360 to 420, that's six or seven hours. So I'm not one of these, like, I barely sleep, I'm a hero. Like, your actual body needs sleep, so you got to do it. Um, and in the beehive, I don't know. I mean, the government's been asleep for three years, so I, I guess <laughs> probably probably anywhere. <laughs> okay, can we, can we start with this, right? So, and I, I was going to get to this later, but we'll go now because you just had another zinger. So... You know, political parties, right? I mean, we've heard the what was a voodoo costings coming up from Labour and the uh, coalition of chaos. Like everyone comes up with these alliteration phrases and things. Do you actually sit down and have brainstorming meetings about what's going to be the best phrase to roll with to go against something? Or like, do people suggest them to you? Do you have like outsource that to comedians, or does it all come <laughs> straight from you? I just I was just saying to you off here, <laughs> like one thing about this business is like everyone thinks it's amazingly organised, and there's really professional people that know what they're doing. And like I got to tell you, this is one reason I'm into less tax, less government, more choices for individuals. Because once you get down there, you realise it's a whole lot of people just winging it. Um, so <laughs> the way that we come up with most of our material and lines, like there's no special committee. We don't sit down like this is brainstorming time for the next 42 minutes. It's it's more just like we try and create a good culture where good people want to come and work and feel at ease. And sometimes amazing what will happen. Like I remember I used to coach high school rugby and what I found was that like, cause I was pretty low grade. So like the kids I had were not going to be all blacks anytime soon. Actually the way the all blacks are playing, maybe they could be now, but, um, <laughs> you know, so maybe they should have picked my kids, but, um, but you know, what I found was that if we created a good environment yeah. where people were happy, then actually they do really amazing things. And so some of our best memes and one-liners and stuff have just been like random stuff sitting around <laughs> the office. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, can we talk a little bit about your journey? I know we don't have you for long, but just your trajectory in, in politics over the last 10 years has been quite amazing. Like whether people, you know, vote for you or agree with the politics or not, like, you know, you've gone from just being the single act representative in government, sort of 2014, becoming the leader, to now looking like at the next election you'll probably be the strongest acts ever been you know you started with the kind of viral video campaign thing rem wearer um to now giving your waitangi address in full te reo your journey's been just quite amazing um why do you think you've seen such an increase in in support for not only yourself but act over that sort of 10 years um gee here's a question you get tripped up if you're not careful um look i i think People are coming to support us, and, and you know, ACT has grown really fast. I think the reason for that is we take a pretty old-fashioned approach to politics, and really, like, if you did social studies in year 10 or fourth form for older people, um, or, <laughs> well, you, were you in fourth form or year 10? <laughs> I was in this weird transitional period really? where they oh, were you changing were it. Yeah, I, I was in fourth form. Yeah, I was in fourth form, but, okay, so, um, you, you know, what do you learn about politician's job is to, you know, listen to people and try and help and represent them, come up with ideas to solve their problems and then go to Wellington or wherever the capital is in your country and, and try to, um, you know, make things work together, like peacefully reconcile different views in the community. And it's that simple. So like from knocking on doors, doing street corner meetings, doing town hall meetings, you know, taking people's calls, answering emails. It's all pretty basic sort of stuff, really. Um, and I think people know that New Zealand's got some pretty big challenges, like just the cost of life and the amount of crime and the sense of we're not really together anymore as a country. I think people want that sort of old-fashioned approach to let, let's just solve some problems. Um, so if, if that's why people are voting for us, then I'd be really, really proud uh, to get that support. Uh, you're talking about... Um representing the community and representing the country. I'm glad you brought that up because you're very successful. Your parents are very successful in their own right as well. Uh, so many Kiwis though, David, haven't had the fortunate upbringing that maybe you had. And with all due respect, it appears maybe there's a disconnect and somebody's upbringing from South Auckland, West Auckland. So maybe you are bringing. So the question for you is, what what are you doing? What is ACT doing to stay connected with those families who are struggling mm. right now in the economic climate? Mm. Yeah, I think 
first of all, can I just address something you've said? I, I think you've possibly got a bit of a stereotype of me. I mean, you may not know, I grew up in Whangarei, I went to a decile one intermediate school, so it's not as though, you know, the, the, you might, I think you've got an image of me that's maybe not quite right. You've had um, a successful upbringing though, David, your parents are very successful. Um, well, you've got a degree in electrical engineering. Yeah, well, I'm, went I'm, to Auckland Grammar. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say my parents aren't successful, but yeah. I think I think you're you're gilding the lily here, a little bit. Um, Compared to my yeah. upbringing, David, mm. it's very different. Yeah. So, but look, I mean, you're a successful radio host, so we we could play this game all day. I don't think it really helps to um, stereotype people. Uh, and it doesn't help to assume people don't know or understand um, because of who you think they are, a little, or even who they are. Um, but what is ACT doing to make sure that there's opportunity for people right across the income spectrum, I think, is really your question. Um, you know, when I had almost no political capital, I ploughed it all into charter schools. And I did that because I went to a, a poor school. I, I know how little opportunity there is for a lot of kids. I want there to be a place in each community where no matter how poor your upbringing is or your parents were, even if your parents don't really want you to get an education, there's still a place in your community you can go where a knowledgeable adult will teach you the best knowledge in the world so that if you've got the potential, you can end up at Oxford University maybe. Um, that's, that's, I think, the dream. And uh, when I had a chance to do one thing, just one of me, 31 years old, straight into Parliament, uh, what did I do? I, I put it all into charter schools that were deliberately targeted at, at low-income kids. So, you know, I think that's a pretty good example. I'd also just say, like, we've spent a lot of time looking at the numbers. And the reason that people are worse off today is not that they're earning less. Income growth has actually been pretty good in New Zealand. Uh, the problem is people are spending more of the income they do have on housing than ever before. So you go back your lifetime, you go back to the early 80s, um, you know, the poorest 20% used to spend a quarter of their income on housing. Now the poorest 20% spend more than half their income on housing. So I would argue we have the most comprehensive policy to get more homes built more affordably so those people who are hardest up have more money left after they've paid their rent or hopefully their mortgage. Um, that education and housing story I, I think does more than... Um, any amount of stereotyping of me um, and uh, what any other party is, is proposing. So if, if you are part mm. of the next government, say, mm. so if you if you and National are, are coming to a negotiating mm. table together, mm. you know, obviously you'll be coming with a bit less support than National, you would sure. assume, historically. So uh, Six weeks to go, but... Yeah. Okay, okay, good luck to you. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. you know, when someone's voting for a, a party, especially one mm. of the smaller parties or not one of the main two, mm. you know, there's always that you look through the policies and you're like, oh, I like this or I don't like that or whatever, or I really like this. But then when it comes to forming a government, you, mm. you wonder how much is going to get across the line. So mm. out of out of all the policies that, that you have and the things that you value, what at the negotiation table will be your key things if mm. you are to form a government that you will yeah. be pushing to get across yeah. the line? Well, I'm, I'm glad you said things because some people are like, what's your one thing? And it's definitely not that. I think the key things are, look, you know, people are going to judge act on can we get uh, the way the treaty is seen in New Zealand society uh, reframed that it's a document that gave everybody Nati Kanga Kato Orite Tahi the same rights and duties, not this idea that it's a partnership between races where you have different rights based on your background, because that that's never worked anywhere in the world, and it has no basis in the treaty or the events surrounding its signing. So we've got to reframe that to being a document of inclusivity rather than separation. Um, second of all, we've got to move the pendulum back uh, away from, uh, I guess, what you might call uh, rights for offenders. Uh, we need consequences for offenders and rights for victims because the amount of victimisation uh, has grown under this government by about 20 or 30 per cent and people are feeling that and not being safe on the streets. And finally, we've got to deal with the amount of government spending and government regulation where they're giving poor outcomes in education you know, weaker curriculum, more politicisation in the classroom, less opportunity for, you know, poorer kids to have a shot at life. Um, and yet at the same time, they're putting so much regulation on everything we try and do from, you know, orange cones to, you know, daycare <laughs> centres having to keep a record of how much nappy cream they've used. Um, you know, bureaucracy means New Zealand has spent more of their life complying and less of their life producing. And that's why we don't have the houses, we don't have the education and we don't have the money at the end of the week. Will you try and be Deputy Prime Minister? 
Um, it's not my main thing. I mean, I'm not interested in status. Um, I think that being a, a position in the New Zealand government, like from a worldwide point of view, is kind of a bit lame like it's not you know <laughs> well it, it is like you know like people are like oh, i'm gonna be like big you fish know, in a small yeah, pond yeah, okay, yeah. Fair like, I, yeah, I, yeah and i heard about somebody <laughs> recently who you know got on an airplane overseas um and they said to the staff do you know who i am i'm the deputy prime minister of new zealand and the, the airline staff went, really? <laughs> so i'm not really into that okay, but okay. the way i see it being in government, being a minister, that's not an achievement. Um, yep. You know, being a minister in government is an opportunity to do good for other people. Sure. Well said. Uh, Bjorn and I were having this chat uh, before we came in here, and we know the demands of your role. We know it's very, very intense. We've seen what's happened to Kitty Allen, you know. So mm. how do you prioritise maintaining that healthy work-life balance so you don't end up going down a road where things self-destruct? Mm. Um you know, the way I look at it is you can only do so much and, and that's enough. You can't try and do more because if you blow yourself up, then you're no good to anyone. Um, so I just say, look, this is the realistic limit. I've, I've got to the point where I've done everything a person could do. That's my week. Um, and then, yeah, I've always found that's worked for me pretty well. Do you, you don't feel any of the sort of online pressure comments, that kind of stuff doesn't really get to you or <laughs> no. is it just thick skin or? Um, what gets to me is when people say things that are true, but when I look at what people are saying about me online, like basically none of it's true. And if it was a true criticism, <laughs> yeah. I probably already would have heard about it and thought about it. So no, I mean, no one that says anything that's untrue affects me at all because I'm, I'm really hot on truth. Um, and I just look at some of the criticisms people make and I just, I, it does sadden me in one way, actually. I feel sorry for people who spend so much energy and effort going to be so nasty, and yet what they should have done is use Google. So <laughs> <laughs> they actually found out some facts for themselves yeah. first, you know, and that, that worries me that some people are, you know, I guess, you know, like, like we, what's the hope for them if they can't be bothered figuring things out before they speak? We definitely yeah. know you need a thick, thick skin to be in mm. politics. We, mm. we might wrap things up. Um, I don't know if Bjorn's got something else, but whenever you decide to call it quits, mm. Dave, 20, 30, 50, 60 years from now, and you decide to... Will you, will, you take, uh, will you take Winston's record? Who knows? And you, you I know, don't want any of his records. <laughs> and you decide to hang up your dancing shoes or, you know, you decide yeah. to put your political football boots away. What would you like, Kiwis, to remember about you? Um, that I made New Zealand a place where your efforts in life make a difference, where you can make a difference... Um, for yourself and those that you care about and your family and your community. I think at the moment there's far too much of, well, you know, everything that happens is because of something in the past. Even hundreds of years ago can be your fault almost. Um, and if you do well, well, you know, we'll put another law or another tax on you. And it just sort of drains all the energy and joy from life. So I want to restore the pioneering spirit that, you know, everyone here is a children of pioneers. In the last 900 years, either you or your ancestors moved here, and you should have exactly the same rights and dignity as a Kiwi, whether you came here 15 generations ago or one. We appreciate your time, David. Mm. I know we, you're, again, you've got a busy schedule. So thanks for taking time out to speak to us here at Life. Thank you. We appreciate you. Stay blessed. Thank you.